Hello, and welcome back to The Corporate Casket, a semi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We will discuss any and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and businesses that have a lot to hide. I'm the Illuminati, and today I'm talking about someone that you probably know of, even if you don't know his name, Louis J. Perlman. He was a record producer who created bands like the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC. He died recently and left behind a whole slew of conspiracies that we're gonna talk about today. Of course, before we get into those juicy details, let's go over who Lou Pearlman was and his rise to fame. Let's get into it. Lou Pearlman was the son of a dry cleaner who grew up in Flushing, New York. He was like any other eight-year-old, even did the classic make your own business of selling lemonade. However, rather than sell lemonade for a year or two and give it up, his business plans continued to grow. He created a helicopter commuter service while studying accounting, followed that with a charter airline, the transcontinental, then a blimp advertising business. Success seemed to come naturally to him. Those businesses brought him to Orlando, where he met new kids on the block. I don't even think I've got to begin to tell you that he saw dollar signs when he met them, and his entrepreneurial brain decided he'd copy their success with local bands he found that had potential. And with that, he made The Backstreet Boys first, then In Sync, O-Town, Natural, C-Note, Take 5, LFO, and US5. He was the best salesman I've ever known, David Mathis, a former Chicago freight company owner who Mr. Perlman took for 2.8 million, told the Tampa Bay Times in 2007. He told us he had 412 airplanes, the company had a value of 1.8 billion, and the IPO was coming out at 17.50 a share. It was totally convincing, but it was a front. As successful as Lou was, there was much, much more going on behind the scenes. Lou's peak was in the 90s. In 1997, the Backstreet Boys made it big in America with the release of Quit Playing Games With My Heart. The song sold 2 million copies in the US and became the most successful single on the Billboard Hot 100 chart that year. While the band rose to fame, Perlman used many of the same methods to develop InSync. However, as Lance Bass told ABC News, while InSync was achieving massive success, he and his bandmates were provided just $35 a day and that was their per diem. Still, Perlman wasn't finished. He started LFO, whose 1999 single Summer Girls peaked at number three on the Billboard charts. He also created C-Note and Take Five. He wanted to get involved in girl groups as well and created Innocence, a group that Britney Spears briefly joined before also going solo. Additionally, Perlman managed Aaron Carter, Nick Carter's younger brother. Now we know what happens here. Perlman gained credibility and once he had enough of it, this is where he started going to his head and used it against people. He began to lure investors, many of them retirees, to put their hard-earned money into his other businesses, which he said were all housed within his corporation named Transcontinental. He even took investors to studios to see Backstreet Boys and NSYNC recording so they could see the bands firsthand. And I mean, think about it. If you were debating putting your money into a business and someone casually took you to see like maybe Katy Perry or Ariana Grande or whoever, wouldn't you feel maybe a little bit more assured? However, Even though Backstreet Boys and NSYNC were real, the travel services and airline Perlman claims to have were not. For 20 years, Perlman worked as a con artist, encouraging investors to invest in Transcontinental Airlines Travel Services Incorporated and Transcontinental Airlines Inc., two fictitious companies that existed only on paper. In order to make his schemes appear legitimate to investors, Perlman created a fictitious airline company, a fake German bank, and a fake Florida accounting firm. It's most brilliant, the lies that people will tell to get money. Lou clearly knew he was going to do some to an extent if he freaking invented the Backstreet Boys, but he still lied to get more and created more and more bands I mentioned earlier, some I've never even heard of. If you ask me, he should have stuck with the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC, which, you know, if he really worked on managing them, he could have really probably finished taking them off. Like they were already popular, but then they all just kind of dropped off suddenly and he could have really, you know, kept at that one. But you know, he decided being greedy and trying to take other people's retirement money was much more exciting, so. Why do it at all? If he had everything, making a million plus record sales in a week, number ones that had never been seen before, like why scam anyone? A documentary called The Boy Band Con, The Lou Pearlman Story gives us an incredible look behind the scenes, including stories from band members themselves. They say that Lou was seen as a big kid and a charming guy. Lance Bass from NSYNC said that at 16 years old, he believed all of the promises Lou told him. He was a kid with dreams coming true. 
he felt like the red carpet was being rolled out for him, seeing fancy cars and having stardom thrust upon him. And Lou treated his boy bands like royalty. I think I'm a great cultivator, Lou said. And these guys are my family. I put the money out to help them where they don't have to worry. We provide tutors, we give them choreographers, we give them vocal lessons. Lou created a kind of boot camp. They were rehearsing six to eight hours a day in Orlando heat without air conditioning in warehouses. And Lou was like their dad. He was big papa and gave them anything they wanted. Remember this for later. His passion and work ethic may have been endearing in the beginning, but it wasn't genuine. Then the trouble started to brew. The Backstreet Boys turned down a single Disney gig and Sync took it and absolutely exploded, hitting the charts. They were starting to make it, even though it was the biggest conflict of interest. His so-called family was pitted against one another and he would literally go to the Backstreet Boys to talk trash to NSYNC and vice versa to keep things that way. Lou once described it as, when there's Coke, there's Pepsi. Someone's going to do a knockoff of the Backstreet Boys. It might as well be me. The money that was coming in was absolutely insane. And yet these band members got just $35 per day. Since everywhere they stayed was free, they ate for free. These kids thought they were kings because they didn't know any better. They toured for years, had screaming fans, no days off and sold millions of records. One day Lou finally said, all right, they're going to get a check presentation. Even if there are only a million dollars divided up by five, that would be $200,000, Lance's mother said. They were excited. Their hard work was paying off, even though they had no idea how much money it was about to be. Their check was $10,000, 10 grand. They sold almost 10 million copies. They were on top of the world. They'd worked 18 hour days, more successful than you can imagine at that time. $10,000 was it. It didn't even come close to touching minimum wage. Their contracts were one of the worst seen in music history, but this was only the start. This was only the first red flag as to what Lou was actually doing. The other side of Lou truly began to emerge then and his family, these boy band members, began to realize they didn't know him at all. Fortunately, we do have some insight as to why Lou Pearlman became this con man and what his motivation may have been. His childhood friends in the documentary state that Lou was not only a successful entrepreneur as a kid, but was also bullied and considered the fat kid at school. He told his friends, one day I'm gonna be rich and when I'm rich, people will like me. Obviously, I can't get inside this guy's head, but from the stories that are told about his rise to wealth and from what I've heard, I'd say this is a case of someone wanting to be admired and liked that got so unbelievably out of hand. Lou went from a kid that wanted to have money, maybe treat his friends and family around him like what he initially did for the band members, only to make it blow up in his face. Whether it was because he got greedy and it wasn't enough or because he was angry that the band members weren't more grateful for their pathetic $10,000, I'm not sure, but it went downhill fast. Thankfully for NSYNC, there was a tiny little out that their lawyers found in their contracts. One agreement was that they had to be signed to an American label within a certain time frame. Well, they weren't signed to an American label, but a German one. So technically this would make the contract null and void. There, as Lance calls it, nugget of hope. Once Lou heard this, he sued them. He sued them for the name NSYNC because it was his name and it was a $150 million lawsuit. In response to the suit, the NSYNC camp issued a statement. Transcontinental's conduct with regard to NSYNC is the most glaring, overt, and callous example of artist exploitation that the music industry has seen in a long time. We look forward to the opportunity to air the full facts and will do so in the weeks to come. NSYNC's members insist they were misled by Pearlman and when they were first signed on with him and that they had not seen enough of the profits that they've generated by selling 8 million albums in America alone. Transcontinental attorney Michael Friedman counters, you can't have agreements and then just terminate them willy nilly. This is an unprecedented move. We still don't understand it. And I don't know what there is to not understand. It's flat out insulting how Transcontinental can act like terminating contracts is on them and they're being greedy. Like, no, you're in a horrible contract. It's good to try and get out of those. These people, especially Lou Pearlman, should have been ashamed for how much he was taking advantage of them. Lou said, the kids should take a step back and see who put up the money, who took the risk. But here's the thing, even if Lou did put up all the money, you can't have people work for months and not expect them to be paid. That's just not how the music industry works. Lou put up the risk, but you have to change your agreement as it gets successful, slowly earn that money back rather than take all of it from their earnings. The judge sided with NSYNC and the Backstreet Boys too, eventually got out of their contract, but the lawsuit was in 1999 and as horrible as what Lou did, that wasn't what he was even arrested for. He wasn't even arrested until 2007. So what are the other dark secrets that Lou is hiding aside from taking advantage of people? Well, we're gonna dig right into that 
after today's break. All right, and let's talk about Canva Pro today. Something that I've actually used for, I think literally years since like 2016 or something like that. And they're sponsoring me now, which is super cool. So I'm one of those people that never actually learned how to use Photoshop, which I know you guys can clown on me for that. That's fine. But um, I've always been like looking around online at like certain programs and things I can use that will help imitate it so that I can still get a really nice finished product without doing it. And that's where Canva Pro steps in. Canva Pro is the easy to use design platform that has everything you need to design design like a pro. And they have everything you need in one place, including a collection of over 75 million premium photos, videos, audio, and graphics. Plus Canva Pro comes with time-saving tools that simplify and speed up the creative process. You get all this and more in just one Canva Pro subscription, which is pretty sick. When it comes to making thumbnails, I like how it's easy for me to add highlights or shadows and crop up images and rotate them, flip them, and do cute little, you know, liquify tricks and things like that with them to make them stand out a little bit better. So if you wanna get started and design like a pro with Canva Pro, right now you can use my code to get a 45 day extended trial. Just go to canva.me slash casket to get your free 45 day extended trial. That's C-A-N-V-A dot M-E slash casket, canva.me slash casket. This episode is also sponsored by Function of Beauty. Real talk, if you don't love your hair, then you may need to break up with your current hair care routine right now, and it's time to try Function of Beauty instead. I've been using Function of Beauty now for a couple months, and I really love it. I think my favorite part is just that every single shipment, I get to pick a different color, different scent, and different needs that I have for my hair based on the season. And here's what you do to get started. First, you take a quick but thorough quiz to tell them a little bit about your hair type and your hair goals, like lengthening, volumizing, and oil control. Then you choose your color and fragrance, or you can go fragrance and dye free as well. And then Functions team determines the perfect blend of ingredients, bottles your formula, and delivers it right to your door. And every ingredient of Function of Beauty uses a vegan and cruelty-free product, and they never use sulfates or parabens, and you can completely go silicone free too. And Function of Beauty offers completely personalized formulas for body and skincare as well, so you can customize your routine from hair to toe. So never buy off the shelf just to be disappointed ever again. Go to functionofbeauty.com slash casket to take your quiz and save 20% on your first order. And that applies to their full range of customized hair, skin, and body products too. Go to functionofbeauty.com slash casket and let them know we sent you. And again, get 20% off your first order. Functionofbeauty.com slash casket. Well, After these cases, Lou started to fall behind. C-Note, Innocence, Take Five, the other boy bands weren't nearly as big. He wasn't keeping up with the times musically as the boy band bubble started to burst and he needed to get bigger. Desperation started to kind of set in and take over Lou, who kept hoping to get that big break he had before. So he kept doing what he'd done in the past and said it worked for him, signing more bands, even though one member of Innocence said her lawyer told her she'd be committing career suicide by signing the contract he gave her. He gave the bands money that they would have made working full-time at a minimum wage job, but they wanted the opportunity. Lou ate it up, preying on their dreams for a music career. And this is where things start to get creepy and 18 plus creepy if you catch my drift. Uh, This is gonna be the moment that I'm gonna definitely put a little trigger warning here that we're gonna talk about sensitive acts that are sexual in nature with underage individuals. So if that makes you uncomfortable, please just skip ahead. Rumors floated around that he was interested in boys, not men, but boys. During rehearsals, he would insist that the members of new groups take their shirts off, saying, according to one member, let me see your abs, you've got to be able to sell magazines, take off your shirts. Lance from NSYNC said he didn't know much about Lou's private life and thought Lou was gay and just awkward, but he wasn't sure what to make of it and always said he was a very touchy-feely guy. He was always massaging you. And one member of O-Town said that against the advice of others, he went up to Lou's room alone at Lou's request to talk about his performance. He said it started to turn into a weird massage where he knew it was crossing the line. Though others say they never witnessed it, there were a lot of stories. To the documentary's credit, they included all opinions. One recording artist said it wasn't true at all. And the most Lou did was teach him how to do push-ups. But that isn't where it ends. Rich Cronin from LFO went on Howard Stern and said that Lou told him there was an opportunity in Europe that could make or break their careers. All they had to do was let this guy with a big recording studio there touch your genitals and pretty much play with it. That's how they do business over there, Lou said. I don't want you to blow this deal, so I'm going to let you practice on me. 
Apparently, Lou even recorded the girl group Innocence while they were naked in his tanning beds, leaving cameras there and offering to show the footage to Take Five, the boy band. His setup has even been described as quite frightening and the control room was in his bedroom. He'd even make veiled threats, not just to band members, but a member like Innocence, anyone he considered his enemy. I don't think I have to explain how disgusting this is. True or not, there's enough stories here to make me seriously concerned. It's not just the documentary reporting on this either. It's not just one or two sources saying these things. The Rolling Stones reported that. Mike Cronin's older brother and LFO's lead singer, Rich Cronin, would allege even more serious concerns about Perlman's behavior, claiming to Howard Stern in 2009 that Perlman wanted to seduce everyone. He also said he needed therapy after his band's time on Transcontinental. Eventually, he did try to touch me sexually. Some other dudes went for it, Cronin said at the time. At the time, members of the other acts Perlman had founded like Nick Carter and Lance Bass did not corroborate these allegations of sexual misconduct or molestation. And if you did go for it, he took care of you. He'd buy him cars. ABC News 2 said that although Perlman declined the allegations, some young men told Vanity Fair and abcnews.com that Perlman exposed himself to them, showed them pornography, took them to strip clubs gave them sensual massages and openly propositioned them. They also said they saw other young people leaving Perlman's bedroom late at night. Some guys joked about it. I remember one singer asking me, have you let Lou blow you yet? Steve Mooney told Vanity Fair. In his early twenties, Mooney worked as Perlman's personal assistant and lived in his home for two years in the hopes that he would be put in one of Perlman's bands. Though I'd say these are the worst of his crimes because this behavior disgusts me the most, we still haven't gotten to what put him in prison. Jacqueline Dowd, the assistant attorney general, described a case she was working on where these model scouts would go to malls and stadiums in Orlando, have attractive young people pay for photo shoots to become stars, and then never contact people again. She said she knew from instinct that the whole operation was a setup. At the time, Lou Pearlman was supporting Charlie Christ, an attorney general. And oddly, Charlie Christ wasn't interested in these cases. What a coincidence, right? that Lou just so happened to be supporting Christ's campaign and Christ so happened to turn a blind eye to these complaints. Christ, who by the way, is currently a congressman. Jacqueline said she thought it was really sad that you could buy your way out of an investigation. That's not how it's supposed to work. Seeing what happened later was very frustrating because it would have been prevented. There was a point where I had it in my hands and I couldn't make it happen. Christ has since been sued for his involvement in this case, though that's been kept relatively quiet compared to Perlman's case. Slowly, the story started to make their way to the surface. Investors that were asking for money back couldn't get it. Lou was no longer answering anyone. He used a different law firm to collect money from a Backstreet Boy contract. And when the old law firm that put in the work sued him and won, he tried to wire transfer them 16.5 million from a bank in Germany. A bank, by the way, that didn't exist. Banks that he borrowed from began to sue him and got money back too, and the FBI got a search warrant in February, 2007. Lou had even taken photos of a model airplane branded with the transcontinental logo at an airport and manipulated the photo to look like an airplane was taking off. And I'm not even kidding. He took photos of a toy airplane close to his camera, holding onto the tail with his fingertips, and it looked like he truly had an airline, all more lies to convince more investors. He was the one airline without a plane and looking back, band members thought it was weird that they were never booking flights with the airline Lou supposedly owned, but always Delta, Southwest, United, and airlines more commonly known. But there was nothing to invest in. It was a Ponzi scheme because Lou used money from new investors to pay off the old ones. But once people want their money back or someone couldn't bring enough new people in, it all fails. That's because there's no money left to pay them. And this was happening in the eighties, even before the boy bands. He had been lying to people for 20 years. As one band member put it, all the people he helped in these bands had been on the backs of money that was stolen. Even when Lou came across as a charming character initially, that in of itself was an act. From the beginning, he was a scammer. Now, because this went on for so long, because he seemed so credible, there were somewhere around 2000 people that invested in Lou, 2000. This isn't a small scheme that hurt a few people and took a few thousand dollars, but 2000 people funded Lou's lifestyle. It's so despicable how many people he actually hurt. I guess so much for wanting people to like you, right? The investor fraud was around $250 million as well as the bank fraud. Lou had about half a billion dollars from these schemes alone and not a penny of it was earned. Though some victims were able to recover their money, 
almost all of them lost their investment funds. One older woman whose husband was in the service said that while in battle, her husband had to see bodies of his fallen comrades. When called to retreat, he had to walk past them, see their deaths up close, all because he wanted to make this country better. And yet Lou Pearlman degraded that, stole from them as if it was nothing. The stories of these families are truly heartbreaking. Anyone, any company, any business, any individual can't have a conscience if they're doing things like this. I don't think Lou had good intentions from day one of starting any of his businesses, even back in college. Everything was fake, everything was criminal. A Backstreet Boy member said, people took their lives over his scenario. How he lived with himself, I have no idea. So as this unraveled, Lou left in a hurry. He knew he was screwed. Everything crumbled, so he simply fled. Now, he did claim he wasn't hiding, and yet at the same time, he was nowhere to be found. Searching for him was an international game of hide and seek, but eventually he was discovered in Bali on June 14th, 2007. Then the trial began. According to the Florida Office of Financial Regulation, at the time of Perlman's investigation, he owed his investors $96 million, but had less than 15,000 in the bank. The investigation found that Perlman's records neglected to show the more than $38 million he had withdrawn for himself and his companies. Perlman pled guilty to a 47 page plea agreement and was charged with conspiracy, money laundering, and making false statements during a bankruptcy meeting. The judge even told him that for every million he paid back, he would take a month off his sentence. Alan Gross, a childhood friend of Lou's and the man that made the model plane without knowing what it was for, said that Lou reverted back to his childhood days in prison and even began calling him from jail. He said he didn't think even Lou really knew how much of a criminal he truly was and kept thinking he was being framed and was somehow going to get out of it, throw a party and things would go back to normal. Of course, that never happened. In 2006, Lou Pearlman passed away in prison from a heart attack. Reactions from those in the documentary were mixed to say the least. One man felt cheated for not having closure. Another sad and upset because he feels attacked in his own life, sympathized with Lou. One woman said she felt relief because she felt terrorized by him. As one puts it, he truly is a cautionary tale of a businessman who let greed spiral so far out of control that he left behind all the success he did create and will now forever be remembered as a criminal. Although I don't wish death on anyone, I can't say that this ending made me particularly upset either. Even if Lou didn't realize the horrible nature of what he was doing, that doesn't make it any less, well, horrible. He manipulated so, so many people. Kids with dreams of being music stars, hardworking investors that trusted in him, everyone. Even though Justin Timberlake says he wouldn't be where he is today without Lou, and undoubtedly Lou did take a part in the boy band revolution, changing music as we now know it, that also can't excuse his actions. No matter how giant someone's name is, that shouldn't make them untouchable. Lou thought his actions would never have any consequences, clearly, and his name and reputation allowed him to get away with things for 20 plus years. But a name alone shouldn't be enough, and it should never take away from the victims that deserve justice. But with that being said, that's where we're going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you learned something new today. And if you did, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. And if you want to connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure you go to my Linktree link in the description box where you'll be connected with all of my social media and other projects that I'm involved in. So again, thank you all for making it to another episode of The Corporate Casket. I love you and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.